good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming. It's really nice to see new faces. I hope you'll all come back. We have uh, teas every Monday afternoon in the library from 3 to 5, and you're all most welcome. Um, it's as You're all most welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're absolutely right. Uh, as the chair of the library, it is my pleasure to introduce Annie Storr, who is talking about Alan, Ellen Gates Star. You got it. Yay. Super. Well, hello. We decided to do this to celebrate Women's History Month. It's March 1st. And if you are in the habit of saying rabbit, rabbit, rabbit on the first day of the month, I actually did it this month for the first time in years. Um, on March 1st, you can say sister, sister, sister. That's the joke. Um, I want to talk, tell a story today. And it's actually several stories and intertwined, kind of co braided. And at almost every point that I show you a picture of someone today, I'm going to say, oh, and there's another story about him. But I'm going to try to stick to this one intertwined, uh, braided story. And it concerns three utterly different women and a circle around them who found their way from Chicago to Anasquam. And I'll identify them briefly and then go forward from there. Um, this is Ellen Gates Starr, who you'll hear about in a moment. I've spent the last 11 years of my life learning about her and trying to share it. Above is Frances Crane Lilly, who grew up on the Crane Estate. And then in the corner is Cora Vauder, who lived on Chester Square for about 40 years. And we're going to see how those stories intertwine. As our main protagonist, to keep this thread possible to follow, um, if you have to, follow Ellen Gates Starr. Okay? She's, the, she's the, 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 the union thread. Okay. So Ellen Gates Starr um, went on to fame, not to fortune, but to fame. But she started life out in Deerfield, Massachusetts. She was an infant, a toddler. Um, the child, the daughter of two parents whose families had both been to every branch in and around Deerfield since the 17th century. The houses that they lived in are now historic Deerfield. And that is part of the story. But in about 1861, um, Ellen Gates Starr's father took his family um, to Laona, Illinois. Now, Laona, Illinois is not even an intersection in farmland anymore. It was a tiny village that was part of a tiny village in northwest Illinois. I think we'll get to why in a minute, but it's, that's another story. As a teenager, she, being uh, precocious and very bright and very bookish, uh, got, persuaded her parents to allow her to go to Rockford Seminary, a girls' school, which within a year of what would have been her graduation became Rockford College and is now Rockford University in Northwest Illinois. There she met in the class she would have graduated with. This is, would have been her graduating class, the woman with whom she became famous because this woman who's also the young lady under the parasol, is Jane Addams. And together, Jane Addams and Ellen Gates Starr were to found Hull House, which is, is an institution that you, either you know about and you're going like this, or that you'll hear about in a minute. However, Ellen was uh, from a relatively poor family. Her father was a rural pharmacist and farmer. And so she stayed at Rockford one year, as you see from a picture from high school up there. She then moved into Chicago after half a year trying out country teaching and became a teacher at Miss Kirkland's school. Now, Miss Kirkland's school was a private, very progressive, one would almost say radical school for very elite girls. It took about 20 girls a year. And through three genealogical steps, it became the lab school of the University of Chicago where the Obama's daughters went and where I went. 
So it was the hub of new ideas about education. While she was at Miss Kirkland School, among other things, she taught art history, which we think is the first, are the first courses in art history in an institution, school or college in America. So she was not just teaching standard curriculum. After, and you see it's 10 years, after 10 years teaching at uh, Miss Kirkland School, she needed a sabbatical. And fortunately, her relatively affluent friend, Jane Adams, who was kind of bored and having a malaise and a depression and not quite sure what to do several years out of college, Jane took Ellen and their classmate and teacher, Sarah Anderson, to Europe. They traveled through Italy, Switzerland, Ellen went to Germany, through France, and wound up in the, in the United Kingdom. They visited all of the major art galleries. We have their notes on how they felt about Velázquez versus Reynolds. Lots and lots of classic sort of cultural exploration that young people did if they could make the big tour, the grand tour at the time. But while they were there, they followed up on a letter of introduction that Jane had from her father. Now we are in the uh, 1880s from her father to a couple named Samuel and Henrietta Barnett. Now I said we might figure out why Ellen's family went to Illinois. We know why Jane's family went to Illinois. And we are told that both families went for the same reason, though they didn't know each other. 1861. Um, in 1860, late in 1859, early 1860, Jane Addams' father had moved to Illinois in order to be the man who nominated Abraham Lincoln for president. And what happened was a number of forward-minded, doer and shaker intellectuals did likewise. And we're pretty sure that's why Ellen's family up and moved after 300 years. So the kinds of people that the Adamses and the uh, stars knew were progressives in 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 England and all over Europe. But in particular, Samuel and Henrietta Barnett, um, uh, gentry, highly educated, very well off, decided to devote themselves to the poor in the East End of London. And they were discouraged by what they saw in terms of do-gooders traveling in, in their carriages, helping poor people for the day and leaving. And they came up with a radical new idea for social agency, social reform, called the Settlement House. And they formed a house in the early 1880s called Toynbee Hall, named for Arnold Toynbee. And if you're into history, you know who that is. So uh, uh, Toynbee Hall was what we would call a gap year institution. When you graduated from Oxford or Cambridge, you could, but we're not sure what to do next, what profession to go into as a young man, you could go spend a year at Toynbee Hall working with the poor under the tutelage of Samuel and Henrietta Barnett. So here is the second class of gentlemen out of Oxbridge who have come to serve for a year. Typically, the uh, staff at Toynbee Hall were in their early 20s. They were all male, and most of them stayed two years or less. However, the Barnetts had some pretty important friends. Um, I actually forgot to put William Morris, the great artist designer up here. He should be there. He lectured at Toynbee Hall. John Ruskin, both a social thinker and an art historian of great note. Charles Ashby, who was uh, a businessman and an architect who designed the whole idea of craft factories where skilled laborers could move out of the ugly city into the countryside and create fine furniture or fine textiles at enough of a clip that they could make a living at it. It worked about 10 years. Um, but, he did, and he, but Ashby established factories all through Western England, taking over old, decrepit, um, mostly uh, textile thread mills that were dying out. And then there's Patrick Geddes. Has anybody heard of Patrick Geddes? Okay. Okay. 
Patrick Geddes was the phenomenon sociologist urban planner of Britain, especially Scotland, Scotland, and of India through the Commonwealth throughout um, the late 19th and early 20th century. But you have heard of him, even if you don't know him. He's the man who gave us the phrase, think globally, act locally, 140 years ago. So he's an incredibly important figure. Now, Samuel and Henrietta Barnett did all right. He went on to become the chancellor and then the dean of Westminster Abbey. But they spent 25 years working with the poor in the East End first. And in Toynbee Hall, the idea was not bread alone. So the art gallery at Toynbee Hall was established in the institution's third year and provided the first children's programs in a museum anywhere. So Jane, who's up above, and Ellen Gates Starr uh, decide while they're sitting in a garret in London that they're going to do the same thing. But it's not going to be for men, mostly, and it's not going to be for gap years. It's going to be an alternative way of living for the educated, especially, well, the educated women who had nowhere to go. Mount Holyoke, Smith, Wellesley, Rockford, Oberlin were all producing bachelor's and master's students, a female who didn't have a great many choices in their lives that allowed them to use their educations. So for personal reasons, they both kind of had come to a dead end. And because it was a great idea, they established in Chicago near the stockyards on Halstead Street. If you've ever been for Greek food in Chicago, that's where they were. They established Hull House. Hull House started in this borrowed, is that you or me? In this borrowed mansion, derelict mansion, and its second building added, uh, let's see, they started in 1888, 89. In 1890, they built the art gallery and the art studios. And then the third building was a gymnasium. And by its height, about 8, 1910, Hull House was four city blocks, 12 major institutional buildings, and, well, one city block of institutional buildings and three city blocks of ancillary housing, um, soup kitchens, and so on. On its highest count day, Hull House served 30,000 people. More typically, it helped immigrants uh, and the poor and orphan kids and injured people, the disabled, at the rate of about 20,000 a day. I'm just about 2,000 a day, to get that zero out, 2,000 a day. They provided food, citizenship classes, language classes, clubs, musical variety shows, art galleries, and pre-college education, much of it taught by faculty from the University of Chicago. You could take qualifying courses at Hull House and then go to the universities, write exams, and maybe you'd get into college without any prior schooling. It was an amazing place. Now, the settlement movement expanded rapidly. Um, by 1913, there were 400 settlement houses in the United States. Um, by 1920, there were between 500 and 800. Some of them were just for post-college workers. Some of them were for lifers. Some of them were religious institutions. Some of them were affiliated with universities. But they served all kinds of people in, in need in the cities. And about 75 of them were in uh, desperate, urban, uh, de desperate rural, rural centers as well. Um, the most famous settlement house after Hull House was Henry House in Manhattan, which is still functioning and serves 60,000 people a year. The, uh, the most famous uh, settlement house in Boston, and the oldest, was Denison House. Um, there were 13 settlement houses up until the Depression in Boston. Like many settlement houses, Denison House morphed. It moved from its first neighborhood up into Dorchester, and it stopped being an open-door subsistence service institution and became an alternative education uh, program and is now, under the same charter, handed down college-bound Dorchester, which helps um, at-risk students get into college. 
let's see, but settlement houses. This is um, the Orphan Children in St. Louis, a musical program at the University Settlement just below Morningside Heights in New York. The Citizenship Class in Honolulu, and the um, reading class on Dante in Louisville. So settlements were everywhere. They had a huge impact. But Hull House was the most famous. And while I'm giving you a number of views, you're going to see that they're mostly empty chairs. And Hull House was all about people. Um, this is the dining hall, the theater, um, the art classical art classroom and then an ex exhibition space behind. But more typically, Hull House was a lot of crowded people at sitting cheek by jowl, eating and talking and talking and eating. So let's look at who some of these people were. All of these people were residents at Hull House at some point. Jane Addams, who we've named, who went on to be by far the most famous figure of Hull House. In fact, the original building is now a museum called the Jane Addams Hull House Museum. She, began, she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1931 for her work during World War I. Here's Ellen Gates Starr. You're going to learn more about her. Lots more. But Frances Perkins, uh, first woman in the ca presidential cabinet. She was Secretary of Labor under FDR and was the longest, is to this day, the longest uh, serving Secretary of Labor. John Dewey, the phenomenon of education and philosophy. Um, Dr. Alice Hamilton, who was a gynecologist and a research physician and was the first woman appointed to a regular faculty position at Harvard. Um, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, author of The Yellow Wallpaper and many other feminist classics. Frank Lloyd Wright didn't actually live there. Um, he was considered rather obstreperous, and he lived out in Oak Park with various members of his various wives and mistresses' his families. Um, but he taught architecture at Hull House for years. Um, Grace and Edith Abbott, who you may not have heard of, but Grace Abbott formed the Children's Bureau of the federal government, which is the, the ancestor of the uh, protective agencies for children, child's welfare in the federal government. She and her sister Grace became professors of social work at the University of Chicago and wrote the first curriculum for training social workers. John Duncan of Aberdeen, this is one of those people who's, it's a whole other story, we'll have to talk about that later, but if you have worn stylized, elegant swirls of Celtic design derivative from the Book of Kells, you're doing it because of John Duncan. As a, he was a painter, probably the most famous painter in Scotland in the early 20th century, um, but he made a cause out of reviving Celtic design. And all of those motifs and things we know were either his or the work of two or three craftsmen with whom he worked. And then finally, two people, and I simply cannot find a picture of one of them. Harold Ickes, who went on to be Secretary of Commerce and Secretary of Labor under FDR, was the attorney for Hull House. And his wife, Anna Wilmarth Ickes, was the third woman and the first woman from Chicago to be elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, which is what they call their legislature. So these are the people you knew if you worked at Hull House. And allowing a little bit for timetables, basically all of these people knew each other, knew each other reasonably well. All right. Now, my original interest in Ellen Gates Starr, and here she is writing, it says, lecture notes for her talks on Gettys, John Duncan, William Morris, and others for courses at Hull House. And you could study Dante with her either in Italian, because there were many Italian immigrants, or in translation. So here's Ellen whose main work had to do with running the art schools, and I say that in plural at Hull House, because the art schools did three completely different things. There was a drop-in art school for urchin children, street kids, who could come in after school hours and be creative. 
and be creative using the late, latest theories of John Dewey and Lois Prang and other innovators in art education. So these are just, you know, these are kids without much else who get finger paint, poster paints were invented at Hull House. Okay. Secondly, the art schools at Hull House included a school of bookbinding and a school of ceramics, which were intended to teach young adults and women who needed to make a living of fine, of, let's see, uh, uh, craft in fine wares so that they could sell goods mostly made at home and might support themselves. This is Ellen in the book bindery at Hull House. This is, we'll talk more about that too, with Peter Verberg. And Peter Verberg was, came into Hull House as a little boy and, I mean, off the streets. We do not know anything about his parents. And he went on to be the head, the director of Cranbrook Academy. So Hull, Bokes, Hull House sometimes could work miracles. Then there was what we would think of as high-end, fee-for-service, leisure arts um, for ladies. And most of the work done at Hull House was done by volunteers, many of them women of means, uh, or at least women who didn't have to earn a living every day. And Hull House catered to them by providing classes in painting and embroidery and bookbinding and other art forms. This is one of the daughters of one of the industrialists from Evanston. While she was learning bookbinding from Ellen Gates Starr, her father's factories were being burned down. And then um, coordinated school-based lessons for teaching school-age kids art, which was not part of the curriculum. So, but it was coordinated with these neighborhood schools. And so you could come in as drop-in or you could take art lessons. Now the reason I started studying this was I was interested in this woman, Ellen Gates Starr, and why she thought art, I'm an art historian, was so important that you would teach it to people who you know, had to start from nothing. And she had some very good philosophical ideas about it. I'll wave a book around later. She wrote many essays. But it is said that she closed the art school. It said she closed the art school in uh, 1892, in 1902, in 1909, in 1912, in 1927, in 1932, and in 1942, which is two years after she died. And this was my first hint because I wanted to figure out why did she close the art schools if they were so successful in every way. This is my first clue that something was wrong in the life of Ellen, of Ellen, I mean the biography, not the life, the biography of Ellen Gates Starr. And that if I wanted to find out why the art schools had been closed, I was going to have to go back and do all of the basic research about her life. I discovered that it was said that she was crippled at the age of 60, which is not true that having been a bookbinder, she bound her last books about 1920, which is not true. Um, that she, um, let's see, what else did she do? Um, that, she, that she left Hull House, that she walked away of a broken heart, which is not true, and so on and so on and so on. So there was a narrative about Ellen Gates Starr that was full of convenient or jumped to conclusion hypotheses, which I've been spending 11 years stripping away. Briefly, she was an artist. Um, she was a bookbinder by practice. She organized the first four exhibitions of the arts and crafts movement um, in America. She was a photographer and a composer, which means somebody who organized the subject matter for photographs. We'll see that more of that later. She lectured all over the United States and somewhat in the UK. She was a painter, and in later life, she became a liturgical iconographer, a Catholic woman, that's part of the story, who began to design modernist motifs for Catholic worship, which might be more accessible to women than those that were traditionally found. But she was working with people with nothing, and she was in particular trying to help find ways for them to make a living, and this got her involved with uh, labor organizing. And in particular, 
because bookbinders work with dyed leather, and so do glove makers. Then the bookbinders and the glove makers had something in common, very fine work with the same material. And the glove makers tried to unionize. And they were not allowed to join the textile workers. They were not allowed to join what, in effect, was the union of people who made stuff out of natural products. They were, just, they were not allowed in because they were women. And if they were women, they might take jobs from men. Now, Hull House was the setting at which most of the unions that were organized in Chicago, and Chicago's famous for its union organizing, actually chartered. They were, you can't meet in a bar to start a union. You can't meet in a church to start a union. Nobody wanted union organizers around. So the unions of all kinds of male labor were um, organized in that living room we saw up high earlier. But the men wouldn't let the women sit in the meetings. So Ellen Gates Starr marched the women of the Glove Makers Union perspective up to her sitting room, where they sat like in each other's laps and founded the Glove Makers Union, which is now the Leather Workers Union all over the world. So there was layers and layers of support. She got really pulled into the labor issues, uh, the inequities of it. She was a defender against working abuse of immigrants, child workers, girls in particular. Um, she used the podium of Hull House because by 1910, she was pretty famous. Not as famous as Jane, but she was pretty, pretty well known. She was, so she would speak and lecture, give lectures and embarrass the, ma ma uh, the mayor of Chicago on a podium and so on to push the issues of labor. Um, later on, she was, uh, as a writer, she's incredibly skillful as a rhetorician, and she published nationally. She took on Samuel Gompers, the labor leader of New York, in the, on the front page of the New York Times and won. He apologized to her on page seven after three parallel editorials. Okay? She also um, published in support of Sacco and Vanzetti, two famous Italian immigrants who were framed for murder. And she called the White House at 12.30 AM, the morning they were meant to be executed. And the president took the call. He didn't change his, he didn't change his mind. But he took the call. She was somebody. Um, and then finally, she um, would march into demonstrations because, let's see, um, when she felt that political protest was not being open to all, she would march into marches. And in particular, she organized a labor march under her auspices. It was kind of allowed to be developed um, because she was its sponsor of 30,000 mixed labor unionists from all over the country. And they wouldn't let her march. So she marched into, the, she tied her finger to the, second, to the First Amendment of the Constitution tied it to her finger and marched into the march and waited to be thrown out by the guys that she was supporting. And she insisted to go to trial. And way down in Circuit Court of Illinois versus Starr is the protection we all now have that says if there was a demonstration in the public street, you cannot be ejected. She was, she was also, I've done the mistake of She was also a religious seeker, born, at, not surprisingly, in Deerfield into a Congregationalist family, raised in the country in Illinois in a kind of local Protestant sort of Unitarian context. She attended Rockville Academy, which I've already mentioned, which was proudly an evangelical institution. But evangelical at the time doesn't mean what it means now. Evangelical meant take your faith and put it into action in the world. So it was a seminary which taught women, look, it produced Jane Addams and Alan Gates Starr, taught women to go out in the world and improve it based on their faith. Um, in 1884, while she was teaching at Miss Kirkland's Academy, she joined the Low Episcopal Church. And about five years later, she joined a high Anglican church, which at the time involved a whole separate 
conversion. It wasn't just like going across the street and changing your membership. In 1920, she took communion in the Roman Catholic Church by traveling down to New Orleans to a particular storefront priest who she admired after what it turns out was seven years of catechism training. So in 1920, yes. Oh, all right. In 1920, um, she was all, well, by night, counting backwards, in 1913, she was already thinking about becoming Catholic. It took her seven years. And at the end of her life, she joined the lay sisters of one of the convent orders, though she never became a nun. And there's a great dis difference. So she was integrating her social uh, mission, her religious life, and her artistic life all together. All right. So I was very interested in this progression. From Ellen Gates Starr, the bookbinder, in this portrait photograph by her Nieces, we'll talk about them in a few minutes, very famous photographers, in which her attribute, her motif, is one of her bound books. Then, in 1914, this is literally her mugshot. This is taken in the office of the commissioner of police in Chicago because she was a famous lady, and so this is how you take a mugshot after one of her many arrests. And then, Seeing that, you know, if you want to make change, you've got to make change, Ellen ran for alderman of the Ninth Ward, which is the ward in which um, Hull House resides in Chicago, in 1916, four years before women could vote. And she got 10% of the vote. She ran on the socialist ticket. ticket. It is said in the papers that she refused to give any speeches, being a lady. But I've found the notes or the transcripts or the, the uh, commentaries for about 15 or 20 huge um, dem uh, mass rallies at which she spoke. She got 10% of the vote, um, even though women couldn't vote for her. And the Chicago Tribune endorsed her over the mayor's pick. About this time, and this, I'm trying to, I, this is another of the threads. My mother, who lived on Chester Square, who died three years ago, said to me, Annie, you know, Auntie Cora would be so pleased that you're interested in Ellen Gates Star. You know they were friends. I've been working on her for six years and I had no idea. So this is my mother. Uh, I'm not sure if it's 2010 or 11. It's shortly before she lost speech. And I started looking at things differently. Or at least I started looking for more threads. To focus on the book bindery for a moment. Here's the portrait of her with Peter Verberg. In the lower corner is one of her books that she bound at the bindery and sold. This is a drawing, one of three drawings of her book bindery, which was uh, published in four different um, culture papers, including the Ladies Home Journal. Um, this was the first book bindery, and women were interested, or people were interested in fine craft hobbies, um, if you were at that more elite end, and they were fascinated by how she had set up a studio bindery. And then, this is where this braid gets really interesting. So here's one of her students. Here's another of her students. This is Cora Vauder. Cora Vauder was a poor little rich girl. Here she is in her high school uh, graduation picture before she did four years of what we would call college. They didn't call it that. They called it continued education but involved four years of math, three years of science, three languages, a thesis, history, philosophy, you know, it was college. And Cora Vauder had gone to Kemper Hall in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Came into Chicago, same story as Jane and Ellen, she didn't know what to do with herself. So she helped out her father, who happened to have started one of the settlement houses in Chicago. And she decided she kind of liked working with kids, but there were a lot more people like her at the famous Hull House downtown. So at some point, about 1907, six or seven, she walks into Hull House, joins uh, Ellen Gates Starr's um, high-end studio, 
And here is one of her books. We also have her, what are called cartoons, her draw and puncture uh, sketch for the cover. This is a Longfellow poetry book. She starts out as a poor little, you know, as a rich girl looking for something to do. And like many women who entered Hull House in that way, here she is in her office in 1917, 10 years later, the head of the Russian immigrant program for the Red Cross based at Hull House. So it was a life changer. And here, though you can't read it, I can. On the inside of a book that had been torn open so that it could be bound, the text pages had been removed, is an order for leather. Here is Miss Culver's, Miss Gaines, Miss Vauders, and Miss Stars. So in a book that belonged to Cora Vauder is this order for leather, which presumably she paid for. Um, we know a little about these other three women, and they couldn't have bought fancy leather. So here are some of Ellen's books, sort of the grand and the not so grand. From the British Library in London, this is her very first book. It's the book that her teacher in London said was good enough that she could move on to professional craft master. Here is a book that it's a copy of a novel by William Morris called John Bull. It's about socialist utopia. And it is a 50th wedding anniversary gift for her parents, which she bound and put into a velvet and silk wrapping. And inside the book, it says, bound um, ab uh, absolutely um, in my bindery, finished 6th of May, 1899, and then signed T.J. Cobden Sanderson. T.J. Cobden Sanderson was the man who gave the arts and crafts movement its name. She, he was her teacher, and she was his only full-term uh, uh, apprentice in his life. So from her you know, beginning books to very elegant books, she published, I mean, she bound fine books uh, that are in major libraries all over this country. This is the Christ to Kin Wolf, uh, published, uh, translated from 19th century Old English by a professor named Cook at Yale, who was a personal friend. Um, it was, he was also the first person in America or anywhere to translate Beowulf. So this is one of those old, old, early Christian books um, bound and now in the library of Smith College. Put this in perspective. This just that came up for sale. This is the five volume Bible printed at Dove's Bindery, which was the, excuse me, Dove's Press, the press of her teacher, T.J. Cobden Sanderson. It is considered one of the most treasured printed books in the world. Um, and a five volume set just came up for sale for 22,000 pounds, both because it's printed by T.J. Captain Sanderson, and bound by Obligate Star. One of my discoveries, one of the reasons this project is taking so much longer than anybody thought, was that everybody thought that Jane, that Ellen Gates Star was kind of the quiet part of the couple, Jane Adams and Ellen, who gradually fell out of favor, gradually, you know, fell out of a a well, romantic relationship with Jane, um, had a kind of broken heart and a not very happy spirit, and simply faded into a shell of herself at Hull House. This is one of those stories that's not true. Because Jane and Ellen, who had shared a room at Hull House, there were only six living rooms and there were 23 people living there, but they shared a room. When the art building, that second building was built, Ellen moved out into separate apartments, including a studio. And it is probably a very significant change in their life about 1890. 18, I'm sorry, about 1898. But Ellen didn't wither away. Ellen, concerned for Jane's loneliness, introduced her to Mary Rosette, who had been a student of Ellen's at Miss Kirkland School. And Mary and Jane lived 
together for the rest of their lives with Ellen under the same roof. So nobody, you know, tiptoed away with a broken heart. Because Ellen's been seen as a kind of shadowy figure, nobody thought to look at what she was doing when she went on vacation. And to put a great many stories into a very fast summary, between 1888 and 1924, she spent approximately four and a half years total in, the, in Scotland, a little bit in Ireland, and a lot in England. And she knew everybody. Um, let's see. Oh, well, here, here's T.J. Cobden Sanderson, her teacher, the head of the Arts and Crafts Society after William Morris's death. This is T.J. Cobden Sanderson's wife, Mrs. Cobden Sanderson. Incidentally, they were the first couple to bind their names, to hyphenate their names, in order to keep the woman's maiden name. It is a common practice in Britain, if you're gentry, to hyphenate a name in order to uh, not lose track of aristocratic lineage, but for the purpose of keeping both, both names alive. They were the first people to do it. So Annie Cobden Sanderson, seen at the time of her arrest, when she was with one other woman, the suffragette who walked up to 10 Johnning Street to deliver the famous petition for the rights of the vote. And she spent a very long time in Hollowell Prison and was either the first or the third woman to be force-fed. So these are Ellen's friends. Um, let's see, Ford Maddox Brown, painter of the working class from Manchester. Of course, the Barnetts, who you've seen before. Uh, William Holman Hunt, a pre-Raphaelite uh, pre painter of great note, uh, who at the time had just, sh in this period, was showing three copies of this painting called The Light of the World, which was considered the, pardon me, Mona Lisa of England, very, very famous painting. And Ellen makes a trip to Oxford just to go see it in Keble College Chapel, where Steve and I went last summer to go see it, where she stood and read out loud John Ruskin's essay on this painting and says she checked the opinions. She went through and like decided whether Ruskin was right or not. Right? Um, this is one of William Morris's books. This is Ancoats Settlement House in Manchester. No city outside of London had a settlement house until the forming of Ancoats in, I have to think of it, this 1896. So there were 12 years between the first settlement, Toynbee Hall in London. There were many in London, many settlements, but none outside the city. And in 1892, Ellen went to Manchester to meet someone who she thought really understood the connection between education, labor, and art. And they sat in his dining room for 11 days and talked. And the result was he formed the first settlement house out of Manchester. And she came back with the idea of establishing public art galleries um, because the man, a man named Horsfall, who founded Ancoats, had also founded the Manchester Art Gallery. It's still there. Walk in, you don't pay admission. It's the first free municipal art gallery for the public anywhere. So this is cross-fertilization. There probably wouldn't have been a settlement house. I mean, when I thought, oh, the young woman goes to meet the great industrial older man, except she'd already been the co-head of Hull House for six years at this time. So. So there are all these connections. And then here is the Hammersmith Socialist Society meeting on the lawn of William Morris's home in London. It is the first socialist party in the, in the English-speaking world. And if I could get you up close, we could pick out. Uh, William Morris is there. The Barnetts are there. T.J. Cobden Sanderson is there. And Ellen's not there because the picture was taken a year before she got there. But she was at the next annual meeting. So look at all kinds of connections in England. And then look at some of Hull House's famous visitors. 
Samuel and Henry Arthur Barnett came in 1899, 1900 on a cross American fundraising tour for Toynbee Hall. We've talked about Charles Ashby. You saw him in connection with um, Toynbee Hall as well. But this picture is really important. I showed you a drawing before. But in 1900, Charles Ashby comes on another cross country lecture tour to raise funds for the National Trust, the Association of Historic Preservation in Britain. And he insults people in Chicago. He says a terrible thing that compares Pittsburgh to Chicago. And they literally cancel the rest of his lectures. And they get some of the philanthropic supporters of Hull House to invite him to tea so that he can apologize to people. And it takes about two weeks, and then they have his lectures. Okay, and they go on and do it anyway. But in the meantime, Ellen and Harold Ickes, remember Harold Ickes? takes Charles Ashby, an architect from England who taught at Toynbee Hall, to meet Frank Lloyd Wright, the architect who taught at Hull House, where Frank Lloyd Wright says, you can't use a drawing in the newspaper, and snaps that photograph. And it is the only photograph used for Charles Ashby in the literature today. So this took, was taken in Chicago. Um, T.J. Cobden Sanderson lecturing on the house beautiful, the city beautiful, and the book beautiful in 1907, and he's seated in Hull House. Okay, these are the windows of the parlor, and on the back his, is his wife's inscription saying there he is in his artist shirt. And there's Mrs. Cobden Sanderson, who actually is the one who's really making the speaking tour because she's traveling in 1907 around, around America raising money for the suffragettes in prison in England. Um, remember Patrick Geddes? Patrick Geddes, the think globally, act locally guy, comes and lectures at Hull House while trying to get himself a job at the University of Chicago, and he very nearly does. Um, Sylvia Pankhurst, the artist member of the famous suffragette family from Manchester, and Mae Morse, daughter of William Morse, the great designer of Liberty Fabrics, who had been running the embroidery shop at Morse's art studios across the street and two houses down in Hammersmith when Ellen was an apprentice. I'm still looking for the proof they really knew each other. But what's interesting about all these people is that with the exception of Samuel and Henrietta Barnett, who Jane had met in London, none of them knew Jane before they came to Chicago. So Ellen is the connection. I'm not going to say too much about the arts and crafts movement. Oh, no. It would be too much. Um, except that it was a movement of social reform and social animation as activism as well as the arts. The idea was these two went hand in hand. Um, here is Ellen, her teacher, and one of her books. Now remember, Ellen left as a toddler from Deerfield. And she maintained her family connections with Deerfield all her life. Her sister, Mary, who's here, this is in Mary's garden, lived in Chicopee, and was very interested in Japanese design and language, and was traveled with her husband in the Orient, in Asia, and brought back motifs into the kind of crafting world. Um, this is Ellen and her sister taking pictures of a pond. Then two of Ellen's uh, aunts in Deerfield who formed the Society of Blue and White Needlework, and if anybody this area is interested in Massachusetts craft. This was a very important uh, quasi-colonial, quasi-arts and crafts movement, and the Arts and Crafts Society of Deerfield, which Ellen wrote the charter for, because she'd done the same thing back in Chicago and Minneapolis and Toledo. She was one of the founders of arts and crafts organizations all over the country. Now. Um, Oh, we don't have enough time to do everything. Here are two photographs, art photographs, not, not portraits, but composed photographs 
by Ellen's nieces. If you're into the history of photography, you know about the Allen sisters. They were called in the press and in Ladies Home Journal the foremost photographers in America in their day in the 1890s up to about 1910. Here is a portrait, as it happens, of one of their aunts, Ellen and Mary and Frances's great aunts or aunts, who is posed by Ellen in a drapery made specifically to create in photographic form the Holbein woman, a real living photograph of somebody as Holbein might have painted them. And then here, the Allen sisters painted Ellen, who was incidentally writing on a drapery of blue and white needlepoint, carefully featured, in the pose of Erasmus by Durer. So this is an artistic and familial connection that brings her back to Massachusetts again and again and again. Another thing that brought her to Massachusetts was one of the closest friendships of her life. And Ellen was made and made other people's lives through deep, deep friendship. And she carried on a friendship with Professor Vita Scudder of Wellesley College from when they met in their 30s until the ends of their lives. Um, Vita Scudder, beyond, in addition to being a great professor of literature, was the philosopher theorist who wrote many of the first books in, uh, again, this period, um, about Christian socialism, the idea that it was possible to be egalitarian and believe in leveled democracy and be Christian and practicing. At its core, this is the idea of evangelism as it was meant at the time. To be faithful to the church, to be spiritual, to explore spirituality, and to carry it out in life. And beyond her regular scholarship, Vita Scudder was the author of many of the major books in this field. Vita Scudder was high, high, high Anglican. And she was the member of an organization called the Companions of the Holy Cross. And the Companions of the Holy Cross sought a kind of Catholic-like spirituality without requiring uh, obedience to the Pope. It's kind of to be ritualistic, to be medievalist, to be prayerful, to be meditative, to sing sonorous ancient music. And one of the major places that the Companions of the Holy Cross did that was at Adelin Rood Christian Retreat, which is in Newburyport and which is still practicing. And Ellen came to Adeline Rood as a companion. So she joined this high Anglican group um, from the 1890s until 1919. And she taught there about sociology, about um, uh, urban living, about Russian politics. All kinds of things were taught in the day classes around the prayer cycles. And here she is at Adeline Rood in Newburyport with Vita Scudder and Emily Morgan, the founders of the Companions, and Ellen. The three of them considered the leaders of the movement at that time. So that brought her to Massachusetts every year. And then in 1920, she did what her sister said, I wish for your own sake you, have done, you would have done years ago. It was in you all along. And she goes down to, uh, uh, to New Orleans, outside of New Orleans in Louisiana and joins the Catholic Church, comes back to Hull House, at which point the literature says, Ellen converted, never came back to Hull House, became a nun, and we don't know what happened to her, <laughs> except that I have the letters from many people who went and saw her there in 1920 and 21 and 22 and 23 and 24 and 25. She stayed. Um, Ellen's aunt had been a famous um, art historian and Catholic convert, uh, a very important uh, connection for her. And her closest friend in these later years of her life outside of Hull House was Frances Crane Lilly the philanthropist and rich woman who literally bailed Ellen out out of every court case over and over and over again, except one very famous one, until Frances Crane went up to a judge and said, you will arrest me. 
And the judge said, why should I arrest you? And she said, because you've arrested my friend, and the only reason you haven't arrested me is because I'm rich. And it goes in the papers, and she is arrested, and the two of them come up in court together. You know, it's their obstreperous women. Eventually, Ellen, at the end of her life, is taken care of by a convent in Upper New York State that specialized in the care of retired teachers. That, that Irish Catholics from Hull House had made the case that she was a Catholic retired teacher. And she was cared for where she wrote, wore this outfit, which is probably the source of the idea that she was a nun. OK, so. In Severn, New York. It is now a strip mall. In Severn, New York, up by Troy. My mother, my mother remembers, well, my mother remembers Ellen being here, but she also remembers driving up with my aunt to meet um, Ellen at Severn on a number of visits. That's many, many, many years. So this leads us to Cape Ann and Hull House. And I think, yeah, I need to go back up one slide and then back. We're nearly finished. Among other things that were said to me, remember I said my mother made that comment about their being friends, was, I mean, I've heard this as long as I've known that Anna Squam was in Massachusetts. You know, so, I mean, and the explanation for why we came to Anna Squam and why my parents lived there and why I went to school in Rockport was that Auntie Cora first brought your Aunt Bunty to Anna Squam to recuperate from the flu. And the problem with that is it's partly true. And I assumed that that meant our Auntie Cora, because Cora Vauder is my great aunt, okay? Auntie Cora had been here since 1917. Flu epidemic, maybe 1918. My grandmother had four children. My Aunt Bunty got very sick and had to be brought to the seashore to recuperate. It all makes sense, except that it didn't happen in 1917. And we'll see why that matters. So here are the people from Hull House who I know or think I know or am looking for the proof, but I have clues, spent time in Anasquam, extended times, more than little visits. There is, of course, Frances Crane Lilly. And it says in her biography that when she followed Ellen and in 1922 converted to Catholicism that she was disowned, except that she wasn't. And she was here all her life with her family. There's Ellen Gates Starr, who we'll see in a minute. There's Cora Vauder, my great aunt, who moved into the house sometime between 1917 and 1922 from her job as the head of the Russian refugee program at Hull House. Then, when I, in college, read the yellow wallpaper, and we were driving into Rockport, I think, to go get Tuck's fudge, somebody driving through L Lanesville said, Charlotte Perkins Skillman, you've been reading the yellow wallpaper. She lived over there. Only I haven't been able to prove it. So I'm looking for clues. I've been working with her three biographers who say, yeah, she spent a lot of time in lots of places in Massachusetts, but it's not in her memoirs. So Frances Perkins Gilman of Hall House, maybe. I'm sorry, yeah, Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And then Frances Perkins, remember the Secretary of Labor? Was from Mount Holyoke, and her family was from, quote, the coast. So I'm trying to find her. And then this intriguing one, Helga Huygen Dean who was the head of the art department at Northwestern University and taught art at Hull House. Only that's not a picture of Hel Helga Huygen-Dean. I can't find one. I can find a biography. I can find catalog entries. I can find pictures of her artwork. That's a picture of Auntie Cora, which says down here, CCV, Cora Catherine Vauder, at Anna Squam by Helga Huygen, 1926. So I know she was here. And I'm looking to see who else was here. Um, here's three more minutes, four more minutes. This is the stuff you're going to like, I think. Um, so this is Cora Vauder. Here's what she looked like when she came to Hull House to bind books. Here she is at Kemper Hall, the seminary where 
the Companions of the Holy Cross, that high Anglican organization that moved to Newburyport, was founded. And in 1900, she graduated. And in 1900, the first national convention of the Companions of the Holy Cross was held in a tent on the lawn of Kemper Hall. Now, in a big modern university, that doesn't mean anybody met. But there were 26 students at Kemper Hall. And the convention lasted two weeks. And the congregants lived, quote, in the, in the buildings of the college. So it's possible that Ellen and Cora Vauder at least you know, knew each other's names from then. Kemper Hall is in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Oh, Wisconsin. It's right above the state line. It's right on the lake. I had no idea till I saw there. You could, if you drank a little bit too much, you would fall on the lake. Um, so here is Cora's book saying, uh, read things you can't read. This is, I think, the first book I bound in Miss Starr's bindery in 1911. So that dates when she's getting up to craft binding. Here's written within six months of her becoming the head of the Russian refugee program. March the 4th, 1918, Dear Uncle Ernest. Her Uncle Ernest was the founder of the Red Cross Emergency Program, first in San Francisco, and then after World War I in Belgium and France. Dear Uncle Ernest, Miss Ellen Starr of Hull House, with whom I have been staying this winter, has a friend, and then it goes on and describes someone she wants to promote for a position in Belgium as a relief worker. Then in 1930, pass passport picture of Cora Vauder. And then, let's see, here's Jennifer's house. Here's my house. Here's the museum, the little, which was, it was a collection of stuff on the lawn. And this is Chester Square. And to give some sense of the degree of friendship that had developed, on the day that Ellen Gates Starr died in 1940 in the convent of the Holy Child in Suffern, New York, the Mother Superior wrote two letters, both of them over 10 pages long, one of them to Ellen's beloved niece and the other to Auntie Cora. So, some more pictures. We'll, we'll pass this book by. This one's a knockout. <coughs> this turned up in one, one of the houses of one of my cousins. Beautifully bound book. I thought it was an Ellen Gates Star binding. This book was made in Miss Star's bindery at Hull House. The binding and tooling done by me. The pattern was one of Miss Star's, which she allowed me to use. But it is not permitted to sign a book you have bound if you have not made the pattern. CCV. So then rather than bossing it, she slipped a piece of paper in. And then this. This is in the archives at Smith College. You recognize by now T.J. Cobden Sanderson. And the photograph, 1899. It was a carte visite, a cardboard photograph, but in a large format, of kind of a gift portrait on heavy stock. And it turns out it was taken in 1899 to give to Ellen when she left his apprenticeship. She finished in 1899, goes back to Hull House, starts the bindery. She comes back in 1900 to kind of finish off um, and stays in touch with the family the rest of their lives. But if you flip it over, this is you know some kind of nasty tar gum where the photograph has been stuck to something. When you flip it over, given to me by Ellen Gates Starr, CCV. They traveled to Iona together twice in 1914. They were there when the war was declared, and they came back in 1924. In 1914, Ellen was a Protestant. In 1924, she was a Catholic. And she writes and says, it makes no difference because the spirit is the spirit. And then here's a family photo album. I mean, one of our family photo albums. Remember, Ellen was supposed to be crippled the last 20 years of her life. She was supposed to have been in a nunnery. She was supposed to have not written anymore. She was supposed to have not done anything anymore after 1920. Funny thing. Except in this particular photo album, watch out for historical view jewels in plain sight. 
here's, uh, this page is recognizable pictures of uh, sites on Iona. Some nice kids. Steve and I went and found this wall with this window with this tuck pointing on the island of Iona. And we think we know who the kids are. And then this photograph of actually five people, one, two, three, four, five, in the quarry at Iona from which Iona marble is taken. It is rough going. Steve and I in good shoes, uh, certainly not crippled as she was supposed to be, could not quite get there to check out the view, but we had local residents tell us that, yep, that's that site. This is Mrs. Duncan, wife of John Duncan the painter. Vivian Duncan, these are the two girls. Bunty and Vivian Duncan, this is all these different pictures. Miss Scott, Bunty Duncan, Miss Starr, and CCV, Iona, September 1924. She was not crippled, she had not stopped traveling, and the only person who could conceivably be taking the picture is the painter John Duncan, about whom I said there was a whole other story. So, in the same album. My Aunt Bunty, not to be confused with this Bunty, which I wishfully did. I thought that might be my aunt in the picture, but it's not. My Aunt Bunty, on the front steps of 15 Chester Square. All of this lattice is still there. Steve dug down to repair the stairs last year and found this flagstone. It's been built up by gravel. 1922. My Aunt Bunty didn't have the flu. She had cranial meningitis. She nearly died and was brought to the seashore by Auntie Cora in 1920 and stayed at least 18 months. And in that time, besides Coffin Beach and many other familiar places, there's Miss Star right by the rock that Jennifer can tell you is there that goes down from the museum. That's the header of Lobster Cove bending down toward the church, and there's Ellen Gate Star. She was here in 1919, 20, 21, 22. We don't know for sure whether she just visited, whether she stayed as maiden ladies sometimes do for a while, or whether she lived here. And I'll save for another time the hypothesis that explains that maybe she lived here, and it has to do with Steve climbing under the house and figuring out the kind of plumbing that somebody who was not very good on their legs by 26, 27 would have needed. So, last. These are the afternotes. More pictures of 15 Chester Square. And then my mother had said, you know, I think there's some of Ellen Starr's books around. You've got to go look around the houses. Okay, six of them came out of Jennifer's house. But the greatest one, and her last book, is this bound volume from Dove's Press of Keats Love Poetry, bound by Ellen Gates Starr and given to my Auntie Cora and dated 1928. This is what the book would have looked like before it was bound. So it just, I mean, it came out of a hutch between the linen placemats. It's been there for, you know, 40 or 50 years. Mom just thought it was there somewhere. It's not, it's not there anymore. Um, but in, after Ellen's death, uh, Auntie Cora shared all of her papers and photographs from their travels with Smith College, which holds the women's studies, the great archive of women's studies outside of the Slazinger Library. She donated to the Boston Athenaeum a whole series of Dove's Press books that Auntie Cora had bought so that Ellen could bind them and they just never got bound or that they would bind together. And there at the Athenaeum, and then she bought a Caleb Allen desk, a very, very, very special colonial desk from the Allen family of Deerfield to give to historic Deerfield the year that was the 100th centennial of Ellen's birth and the 20th anniversary of her death. So, who could have known these women? Whose letters or diaries from around here might mention them? Who else visited, stayed, or lived here? Um, David McAvaney's wife was at Hull House. So this is what I'm doing, trying to go through Ellen Gates Starr's life. 
And then these are the people I have to thank. Three, three grants, Brandeis University, and these libraries. I've been to all of them but one. And these. I even put a note back there if anybody has any links, connections, clues, anything, I want to know them. And I thank you.